ten little Christians came to church all the time. One fell out with the preacher, then there were nine. Nine little Christians stayed up late. One overslept on Sunday, then there were eight. Eight little Christians on their way to heaven. One took the low road, then there were seven. Seven little Christians chirping like chicks. One didn't like the singing, then there were six. Six little Christians seemed very much alive. One took a vacation, then there were five. Five little Christians pulling for heaven shore. One stopped to take a rest, then there were four. Four little Christians, each as busy as a bee. One got his feelings hurt, then there were three. Three little Christians couldn't decide what to do. One couldn't have his way, then there were two. Two little Christians, each one, one more. Now, don't you see, two and two make four. Four little Christians worked early and late. Each brought one, now there were eight. Eight little Christians, if they double as before, in just seven Sundays, we have 1,024. In this rhyme, there is a lesson true. You belong either to the building or to the wrecking crew. Yes, how important it is, what crew you belong to. The building crew or the wrecking crew. Well, I hope we all can learn from Nehemiah how to be part of the building crew. Nehemiah, you, he had to deal with wrecking crew people, those who wanted to stop progress, those who wanted status quo, those who were enemies of God's work, but uh, he found a bunch who wanted to be on the building crew, and he led a building crew, uh, because Nehemiah found that the people of Jerusalem had a mind to work, Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. So uh, I, I hope that you're on the building crew, and if so, let us rise up and build. A big part of the building strategy of Nehemiah was prayer, and that's what I want us to look at in this, uh, in this video. In our look at Nehemiah so far, we've already noticed prayer. Uh, it's hard to miss with him. So in chapter 1, when he first gets the bad news of conditions back home in Jerusalem, he immediately goes into a prolonged period of prayer and fasting, mentioned in chapter 1, verse 4. And we have a sample of, of one of those prayers in verses 5 through 11 of the first chapter. In chapter 2, when he finds himself standing before the king, King Artaxerxes of Persia, who has noticed the long face on Nehemiah, and he's asked about what's caused this, um, Nehemiah is, is asked what it is exactly that he wants to do. And, you know, is he asking the king permission for something? verse 4, and before Nehemiah responds to that question from the king, and frankly, you know, Nehemiah realizes the way he responds might be the difference between his own life and death. He says about this that he's very much afraid in verse 2, but before he tells the king what he wants to do, he quickly prays. That's the end of verse 4. And the prayer is not recorded, but it's noted that he prayed, it says, Nehemiah says, in the first person, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Before I put my plan before the king of the world at that time, the king of Persia, the great Artaxerxes, before I ask his permission for a leave from my job as a cupbearer to the king, before any of that, 
I prayed to the ruler of heaven, the king of the universe, the one who was really in charge. Well, I love that, don't you? You know, there are so many characters in the Bible, and frankly in real life, but as we're studying the scripture, there's so many biblical characters who could have avoided major problems if they would have just prayed first, uh, before they acted, before they spoke. So I think, for instance, of a King Saul. What if he had prayed before he decided to take it into his own hands and, and pretend he was a priest? What if David had prayed the moment he first laid eyes on beautiful Bathsheba? or any of the other several moments as that story got worse and worse over time? What if Peter had prayed before he said some things? And what if Judas had prayed when Satan started knocking on the door of his heart? Maybe you can think of times in your life when a prayer like this might have saved you from great grief and anguish. How might a prayer right now bless you and protect you and your soul? Scripture says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Well, ought we not always consult God first? Before we beg the help of any earthly ruler or authority, before we ask permission of any mere man, ought we not first to seek the face of God? Especially before we take our own advice and follow through on our own schemes and blindly pursue our own lusts, should we not first speak some words to God with whom we have to do? Now notice here, in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 4, uh, you know, this wouldn't have been some elaborate, well-planned, written-down, flowery prayer. It was a prayer in the heat of the moment, an arrow of petition shot toward heaven on the fly. I, it's like Nehemiah saying, I only have the briefest of moments, Lord, but here is what I'm thinking Please bless me, or prevent me, or whatever is best, may it be. Something like that. You ever pray such arrow prayers, prayers on the fly? I think we need to. Uh, scripture says something that uh, people are often confused about, I believe. It says to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul wrote that. And again, I think that's often misunderstood and misapplied by people in a way, and, it, and misunderstood in a way, ironically, that keeps us from doing it, keeps us from prayer. And what I mean is that we hear that command, pray without ceasing, and we think that means something like pray, pray 24-7. You know, and, and we realize we can't do that. We can never do that. And so we're discouraged in our prayer life and we fail to pray when we need to. But I think Nehemiah here teaches us what pray without ceasing really looks like. It's sort of like if you think about something common that we almost all have. It's sort of like your phone, your smartphone. Um, if you'll forgive such a an unspiritual analogy for a, uh, a deeply spiritual truth. Your smartphone, theoretically, is connected. It's online all the time. So whether you're paying attention to it or not, you continue to receive emails and texts and status updates and direct messages and the like all the time because you're connected, whether you're conscious of it or not. Well, praying without ceasing is, is like that. You're connected all the time to the God of heaven. 
And at any moment, you can focus your attention and you can consciously pray at any moment in any circumstance. I, you know, you can look down like you often do at your phone and, and whisper the prayer of your heart to a God whose attention is unlimited and uh, it is immediate and it never fails his attention. And shame on us if we don't take advantage of that connection that God has given us. Now, you know, sometimes we might stare at our phone, excuse me, I mean seek God's face, in a more concentrated, lengthier way, longer periods of prayer. And, and we should, and that's good. But at times, you know, we would all do well to learn from Nehemiah's prayers that we need to speak to God perhaps at any moment, and perhaps for just a moment, for just a second. And it just might make all the difference in blessings or curses received. It might make all the difference in successes or mistakes achieved. Now, as I read through Nehemiah, I find at least 10 times in these 13 chapters that it's mentioned that Nehemiah prayed. And most of them are short, simple prayers in the moment. The very kind that I think many of us so often leave unprayed. But they're prayers, you see, that, that show such trust and faith in God. God doesn't need our flowery words, or our long petitions. Now, have we not learned from the words of our Lord? Jesus said, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. That's in his great sermon. Matthew 6, verse 7. God is not impressed with our fancy words or our deep thoughts. He doesn't care if we address him with King James pronouns in all the right places or if we put on sort of a holy tone. Come on. You know what impresses God? A soul that turns to him at the right moment. God blesses the one who truly and humbly seeks his attention, even if for just a few seconds, a few seconds of earnest prayer trumps five minutes of vain repetition every time. And so Nehemiah prays. He prays at the beginning of the book, and in the very last words of the book uh, are a prayer. Chapter 13, verse 31, again, one of those little arrow prayers. And then he prays all throughout the book. Just to make a list, chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Chapter 5, verse 19. Chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 14. Chapter 13, verse 14, 22, 29, and 31. He prays when there's a tough job he's faced with. He prays when enemies attack, like in chapter 4. And then sometimes he prays after a job well done, like in the closing words of the book, chapter 13, verse 31. There's one other thing about Nehemiah's prayers that I want to close with. It's a phrase that he uses repeatedly uh, that I, I think might be, again, misunderstood if we're not careful. But several times, including in the last words of the book, chapter 13, verse 31, Nehemiah says to God, remember me. So as an example, chapter 5, verse 19 Nehemiah has just told about how, as governor of Jerusalem, 
he had not taken much at all in the way of normal compensation for his services. Uh, he had not put the burden of support on the people who, remember, were in desperate circumstances, probably couldn't afford to support him. Uh, he didn't do as most governors of the time did. And so he says in his prayer in verse 19 of that chapter, he says, Remember for my good, O, o my God, all that I have done for this people. That's his prayer there. In, in chapter 13, verse 14, Nehemiah had led some very important reforms in the temple worship and basically made it the way God had always wanted it to be. And he says in, in the prayer there, he says, Remember me, O God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Then just a few verses later, in verse 22, Nehemiah directed the people to keep the Sabbath more faithfully. And, and so he prays and says this, Remember this also to my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Then again, in the closing words of the book, in uh, verse 31, chapter 13, Nehemiah has, has taught the people about marriage. And he's worked amongst the people to build up strong families uh, amongst the population of the city. And so again, the closing words of the book are, are this prayer, when he says, Remember me, O God, for good. What do you think of that prayer? Do you ever pray like that? Sort of list uh, what you've done, list your successes, and then remind God of them and ask him not to forget? I imagine if you're thinking through this with me that that might almost sound self-serving, even self-promoting. Uh, and and we, we don't believe that prayer ought to be selfish, right? But I think that's the misunderstanding, um, to, to think of what he's doing in that way. These are not the selfish prayers of a self-centered man. Really what they are is a prayer of trusting faith. For when God remembers, it's implied that he acts. Uh, you don't have to jog God's memory. Uh, his memory has no faults. But when Nehemiah asks God to remember, he's asking God to act. So it really is a selfless thing that he prays. It's selfless and it's faithful. He's saying, do good things, O God. Keep on doing good, O God. Keep working through us, God. That's really the thrust of the prayers of Nehemiah, prayers of faith and trust, calls for action and genuine belief that, that God is going to do something great among his people. That's how to understand those prayers, I believe. And those are prayers we can pray today. Uh, we really need to pray today. Who doesn't want to hear from God one day those cherished words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so we pray as a people, remember us, O oh God, for good. And, and when we say that, we do not mean remember how good we are, God. No, we mean we trust you, Heavenly Father, and we, we want you to work amongst us and we ask you to lead us and to be with us as we rise up and build your kingdom here on earth. And we expect that you will. That is a prayer worth praying. And it's one uh, that we learn from the example of Nehemiah, among others. Remember me for good, O Lord. I hope that uh, 
this is a good reminder and challenge for all of us as we study through this book. Uh, it's really bathed in prayer, all the, the life and the actions of Nehemiah. Again, our prayer is that you are well and that, that you are glorifying God in the situation you're in right now. And may God bless you and continue to do so is our prayer.